you know, in the history books, it seems really fast. Hitler and then uh, war and Holocaust. That's not how it was experienced in real time. It was Hitler and then kind of threats of various sorts. And what happened was they thought at first, this is like an increment that's not good, but it's not going to end up where it did. So the people who were there said it was like uh, being in a field with the corn growing and growing and growing, and then it's over your head. But you, but you didn't notice it going over your head until it was. I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. I'm John Favreau. I'm Max Fisher. And you just heard from this week's guest, Harvard Law professor, world-renowned behavioral economist, and fellow Obama alum, Cass Sunstein. Cass and I are old friends, having first met on the Obama campaign in 2008. Probably could have invited him on the show to talk about any one of his books. He's written over a dozen, including the 2008 global bestseller, Nudge. But today I wanted to talk about his newest book, Look Again, which is out on February 27th. Look Again is a book about habituation, how when things become part of our daily lives, they begin to blend into the background, preventing us from fully appreciating them or, in the worst case, understanding how they might harm us. Uh, It's a very offline book. It sounds really good. It's very offline. Uh, Cassie emailed me about it and I was like, (laughs) he's like, would you want to do a quick interview on this on one of your pods? Oh, I was like, boy, oh, do yes. I have the pod for you. <laughs> uh, he's kind of the third chair. And even when he's not on, he's kind of here with us in right spirit. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's very offline, especially as it relates to what Cass uh, calls in the book our technologically induced coma. Uh, and it has some important lessons about social media, misinformation, mm. and democracy, which are all things that we Those love talking about Those are my three here. favorite things. That's what I was, yeah. <laughs> uh, but before we get to that, speaking of... Uh, Uh, technologically induced comas Uh, (laughs) meta has announced that instagram and threads the company's twitter competitor will stop recommending political content the change will limit the content users see from accounts they don't follow preventing accounts that talk about politics from appearing in the recommended feeds. Hmm. Uh, Despite the potential consequences for the upcoming 2024 election, Meta has yet to clarify how they define, quote, political content. So uh, huge implications for how people consume news on those platforms, right? Yes. And I I think Facebook itself is going to follow, too. Yes. At some point, they said. So just to, like, parse out what this means, because I think there's a lot of confusion about what they're actually announcing. Facebook and Instagram and threads, threads, come on, (laughs) are not going to be suppressing individual posts for being political and no one is getting censored. Rather, what's happening is that the algorithms will no longer show you accounts that it both considers to be politics focused, although no one knows how it determines that, and that you do not already follow. So this is going to change the platforms a lot, though, I think in at least two ways. Number one, this is going to be bad for big, explicitly political accounts that want to use Instagram or Facebook to reach new audiences. Like like Pod Save America or right, Crooked right, Media. Exactly. Right. <laughs> I, like This is going to affect us because yeah. this will limit our reach and our ability to reach new audiences. And that will be true, I think, for basically all media outlets, reporters, political activists, so on. We don't know whether that will also be true for like influencers who sometimes post about politics because probably Facebook doesn't even know exactly how their algorithm is going to filter this. Um, and this is part of a message that like Meta has been sending to institutions like us for a while that they, they kind of just don't want us anymore. Mm. Like they've been breaking up with news for a while now. Uh, but the second and I think probably bigger, more consequential change, even though it's not going to be as obvious initially, is how this will change the experience for users, uh, because this does not actually mean that you will no longer ever see political posts or content, because that's now how the algorithm is filtering, right? It's filtering by accounts. So you might still see, like, say, algorithmically promoted posts from influencers who mostly talk about, you know, sports or fashion or comedy or whatever that mention politics or things that discuss politics indirectly. Um, And we have a sense, I think, for how this will play out, because back in 2018, Facebook actually tried an experiment very similar to this in a like handful of six or seven countries in the global south. What they did is they put everything related to news, so they were filtering by news rather than by politics, on a separate feed mm-hmm. away from the main news feed. So your primary news feed no longer had any news accounts on it. Um, but what happened, one of the like big important learnings from this is that people did not actually stop caring about news. 
They didn't stop being interested in, they didn't stop wanting to discuss it, they didn't stop clicking on it. So all of that desire among users in the audience to discuss and consume news content just got diverted away from credible news sources mm. and instead towards non-authoritative accounts like random influencers or rumor mongers or like your aunt and uncle, like whatever they had to say on the topic, like whoever happened to fill this vacuum left where the credible news source has been. And one of the countries where this experiment took place was Sri Lanka, which mm. became actually kind of notorious for this because the result was the void where news sources had been got filled by conspiracy theories and race baiting rumors because that's what was available to fill this desire for people in this country to talk about what was going on in their communities. And this ran so rampant that it snowballed into mass incitement to race riots that Facebook later admitted it had like more or less caused. So I think my worry is not that this new change will suppress political discussion or political influencers, even though it's going to be bad for institutions like us. But people will still want to engage with those topics. So it will degrade, I think, maybe substantially the quality of information and discussion that we get on them. I guess my question is, is it to that point, do we feel like the algorithm as it currently exists <laughs> right. is showing people the kind of news and information that is making them more informed and less <laughs> polarized. That's a good point. This is like, it's another incremental step in a direction they've already been going. Like mm. Adam Masseri, who runs Instagram, said a while ago, like, we're not going to be promoting news anymore. And they're trying to pull people away from this. So I think some people look at this and they get concerned and they're like, oh, my God, discussion of like, you know, racial justice won't exist anymore on these platforms. And what we've seen already from how these changes have played out is that it does. We're just diverting that interest in those topics away from credible sources to less credible ones, which leads to a like much worse quality of information that we're getting and much worse quality of discussion. And it's like Facebook's, they, they just want to maximize engagement. Like that's what this is always all about. It makes me think that, and we've talked about this before, every time one of these social media companies and especially meta uh tweaks the algorithm mm -hmm. there are you've written about this obviously there are unintended effects that are usually uh bad <laughs> right so Crazy you try to downstream. solve you try to solve one algorithmically right. <laughs> generated problem right. you try you think you solved it and then it creates uh, a whole bunch of unintended consequences that you hadn't thought about and the real problem is the existence of the algorithms themselves. And so if you go on threads, which I do because I'm a big threads guy. <laughs> uh, you threaden? Th I'm threaden <laughs> left and right. So there's two, there's two columns that you can choose. There is for you right. and there is following. Right. And I never go to the for you column because I'm like, I don't want to just be recommended bullshit mm -hmm. from Meta mm -hmm. uh, based on some algorithm about what I want. I chose to follow a certain group of people because I, I either trust the news sources or I like their opinions and their takes. And so those are the people that I want to follow. That will not change at all from this. Right. And right. if you even if I wanted to make sure that my for you feed, if I if I was into that sort of thing and I liked the for you feed, you can there's a setting where you can say, I do want to be recommended political content. Right. So you can, so you can right. do that. Right. So basically, this is just saying to people like, I mean, we talk about like, you don't have a right to amplification. Right. <laughs> like yeah. everyone has a right to have their voices heard. No one has a right to have their voices heard by strangers who didn't ask for it. <laughs> right. Which is what algorithmic amplification is. And right. Is, is going to be taken away from certain accounts. Yeah. And I kind of, I mean, again, as the, as the founder of this company, I, I would I would like us to be <laughs> right. able to We'd like to reach people. We'd like yeah. to reach people who might not necessarily have heard of crooked media mm -hmm. via algorithm. But if it's not via algorithm, then like it, it sounds like we're going back to the days where it's like you have to build your own following, right? And you have to go by word of mouth and you advertise all this other mm -hmm. kind of shit, right? As opposed to just like spinning the wheel and mm -hmm. hoping that the algorithm recommends you to like-minded right. people. Well, this is the moral dilemma that these platforms force all of us into. Is that like I, like you, believe that like crooked media does good work that would be helpful to people. So like the idea of reaching more people with it. But that means participating in something that we know is overall harmful to society, even if occasionally a good post or a good account like ours, which is impeccable. Uh, the best posts. <laughs> <laughs> might benefit from it. And I think also like 
something really important, like the, you made the point, which is a good one, that anytime you try to solve one problem with an algorithm change, you create a ton of unintended downstream consequences. And like, I think it's that's true. And it's even worse than that, because they have said before, whenever they make an algorithm change, they always present it as like, oh, we're fixing a social problem. We're fixing some harm created by yeah. the algorithm that has never once been true. Every single time, the reason for the change is that they have deduced that this is going to be a way to juice engagement. And they, after the fact, after they've decided we're going to push you more towards people in your community, or we're going to push you towards this kind of content or that kind of content, because it will juice engagement, they say, oh, by the way, we'll also fix polarization. <laughs> and that's never been the actual goal. It does seem like the reason, one reason they did this mm -hmm. is they were tired of getting shit about influencing politics yeah <laughs> you know and they're like you know what then we're out <laughs> we're out you can you can follow uh political content if you want you can talk about politics with your own followers mm -hmm. in your own feeds but our algorithm we're out of politics so enjoy i think that's true but i think it's also like since Instagram made this change that they are going to significantly downrank news, their traffic has gone way up, especially among younger people. And like the hmm. relationship between those things is probably more complicated than young people don't want to see things that are explicitly branded as news and probably has to do with the kinds of accounts that are getting promoted. But I, I to me, I think it's absolutely correct that they're tired of getting yelled at. But I think if they thought there was the best way to get more money and more engagement was to lean into news, I think they would do it. And I think what they have learned is that the strategy that they're going down now works for them financially. Hmm. I do. Um, I have a concern about it just from a like democracy political perspective, which is, you know, it is really hard right now for political campaigns to reach infrequent voters who right. do not consume a lot of news right. and this will make that harder right we there are and we're going to talk about tiktok in a second but like there are a shrinking number of levers that mm -hmm. we can pull to reach voters right. and uh fewer people are watching television television ads now twitter's sort of broken and the decentralization of media has now mm -hmm. become like the disintegration of media right. and it's just really hard to get anyone to pay attention to anything we've talked about monoculture a few times here too yeah. and if you don't have the tool of algorithmic amplification mm -hmm. on one of the biggest social media platforms in the world um that's gonna be tough it's going to be tougher to reach people. And not only will it be much harder for political campaigns to reach those infrequent voters, but those infrequent voters are going to get on their social media feeds much more uh, non-credible sources, rumors, misinformation, because that's what we know fills that void. Yeah. And will they? are you saying they'll get that because the people they follow will put that in their feeds? It's because everybody has a some level of desire to read about things that are happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And they have some level of innate denier, desire to read about news and information and social issues. And when they are denied access to news accounts or credible political accounts, as this algorithmic change is going to do. But does it but it doesn't deny them access to it. No, you're right. Doesn't deny them access to it. But they will doesn't in their put it in front feed, of their face. It will not be right. What will be filling that need instead, the the available supply to fill that need, that desire for political content, is going to come from one step down in terms of credibility from the sources. Hey, uh, go to the New York Times, everyone. Go to the Washington <laughs> Post. I know. Listen to Pod Save They're America. Listen to yeah. offline. Listen yeah. to Pod Save America. Great ways to get credible news. You're just going to have to do it instead of having it shoved in your face yeah. with an algorithm. This Wait. is why I'm so, it's a little like, and I also, I, I saw a lot of people say this is going to like silence. It's not going to silence people. That's it's just right. not. Right. Like yeah. you, the people who choose to follow you mm -hmm. and, and you will still be able to, uh, anything you want to say, mm -hmm. all those people will still be ex as explicitly political as it is, <laughs> right? Or or less explicitly political. Everyone who follows you will be able to mm -hmm. see it. And if they want to share it, they can retweet it or right. rethread it or whatever the fuck we're talking about now. <laughs> uh, so all that still exists, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just that if you're betting on the For You feed that, or in, right. in the Facebook news feed or, or Instagram or whatever else, right. um, it's not going to show up. Which we've all been trained to rely on to some extent. Yeah, although I hate it. <laughs> sure, but that doesn't mean that it's not incredibly yeah. influential. Well, 
My, so the so the recommendations out of this is uh, go find credible news sources right, to read right. <laughs> as opposed to just relying on your algorithm and maybe don't rely on the algorithm and actually just think about your followers, who you are following yeah. and, may, and and then who follows you as a, as a way to I agree. make sure that you are educated and informed right. about what's yeah. going on in the world. Um, all right. Well, for TikTok users who are looking for political content, do we have good news for you? <laughs> <laughs> Joe hot, Biden. Hot new influencer on the block. Joe Biden has <laughs> finally joined the platform. Last Sunday during the Super Bowl, the president's official campaign account posted its first ever TikTok in which Biden answers some either or questions about the Super Bowl and makes fun of a few right wing conspiracy theories. Let's play it. Chiefs or Niners? Two great quarterbacks. Hard to decide. But if I didn't say I was for the Eagles, then I'd be sleeping alone. My wife's a Philly girl. Game or commercials? Game. Game or halftime show? Game. Jason Kelsey or Travis Kelsey? Mama Kelsey. I understand she makes great chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Deviously plotting to rig the season so the Chiefs will make the Super Bowl or the Chiefs just being a good football team? You get in trouble if I told you. Trump or Biden? Are you kidding? <laughs> Biden. I like that he had to say Biden at the end. Are you kidding? It is Biden. Just, just to remind us who we're looking at, who we're voting for. Can we yeah. talk about the setting? Where, where <laughs> was he? Was he at like my grandmother's house? I like the little dip he did, the little dance. How many social media consultants got paid to say, Biden, do a little dip? <laughs> Honestly, I think that was, uh, I think it was organic. Um, all right. So uh, youth vote secured. I mean, look, of the two of us, you are the kind of election knower here. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that this reminds me of this legal term of art, necessary but not sufficient. <laughs> to me, Biden 2024 joining TikTok, it is not sufficient to going back the youth vote, but it is necessary. Like we talk a lot about TikTok's dominance among young people, but you really can't overstate it. Like I was looking up the numbers this morning again. I had forgotten this. The average American aged 18 to 24 spends twice as much time on TikTok as any other platform on average. Wow. Yeah. And nearly a third of Americans under 30 say they regularly get their news from TikTok, right. according to Pew. So, it's so that's a lot. It's absolutely a huge, dominant. So you yeah. kind of have to be on it. I think the Biden campaign is uh, very well aware of the limitations of the strategy, the sure. necessary but not sufficient. They've said this <laughs> um, and they have said before that what's going to be more important is to have people, uh, Biden supporters who are TikTok influencers, who have big mm -hmm. TikTok followings, have them post content. <laughs> more so than the, whatever the campaign does both of them <laughs> <laughs> exactly well that's the challenge that's the challenge um but you know rob flaherty who uh is the deputy campaign manager there and was the director of digital in the white house before that he talked to dan for pod save america he also talked to charlie warzel um after the tiktok account happened mm. and he said uh in 2014's internet you could afford to swing big and hit home runs big one-off campaigns for more centralized audiences hmm. that's changed now we're going to look for home runs but we've got to collect singles and doubles it's about being in more places and narrow casting and getting them to add up to a broadcast so their strategy for tiktok is not necessarily like we're going to post this TikTok of Biden and it's going to go viral. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like that's they, what they're trying to do is build an audience of supporters mm -hmm. who when there is a big moment and oh, they post, then those supporters will share. So it's a, right. much more of a base play than it is a uh, we're going to like go viral and everyone's and which makes sense because if you look at all the comments on all the Biden things, it's just like Rafa, Rafa, Rafa. It's all about Gaza. Sure, right? Yeah, right. And right, um, right. and we've talked about that before. Right. But I think they would say like that's not that's not necessarily concerning to them because the point of it right. is not to m have everyone it's not persuasion right <laughs> it's like giving your supporters messaging and a tool to go out oh, and evangelize the message that feels like that that makes sense for kind of the metabolism of TikTok and the way it works where you've got these relatively siloed communities and relatively siloed topics with a lot of big voices within them yes. you want saying things that are favorable for you yeah but again i mean their challenge and they would have this challenge if if uh, an 81 year old man was not at the top of the ticket any campaign would have this challenge right is, now is he 81 i didn't know that yeah yeah i've heard uh, i don't know if you've heard um but uh the, it, it's just communicating in this media environment as a campaign is yeah. is going to be excruciatingly difficult something that i think is incredibly hard for a, a structural disadvantage for democratic 
candidates especially, and for incumbents, so he's facing both, is the growing role of negative polarization in social media where... Because social media is built for negative polarization. It's built for, and it always has been, and but it's like becoming much more severe where the idea is that you don't go viral by saying like, hey, the child tax credit was really great. You go viral by saying this thing that happened, I'm really upset about, I'm really outraged about, which is not to say that that's not legitimate, but when that's where the overwhelming focus is and you are both the party that is trying to do things rather than the Republican Party, which is more geared towards preventing things or tearing things down, then that's harder for you. And of course, when you're the incumbent, it's harder for you. This is the whole challenge with uh, the Biden people being very frustrated over knowing no, no one knowing about his accomplishments, right. because every time you talk about the accomplishments, it doesn't get covered. Right. And it certainly doesn't get covered on social media because right. you if you post about Biden's accomplishments, even right. if it's not Biden, if you post about anyone's accomplishments, right. <laughs> any politician's accomplishments that you post about, not going anywhere. Because right. when you see it, you're like, and we what I about to, this? this is sort what of about, habituation yeah. when I talk to Cass about, right. which is like, you see it, great, that's fine, whatever, right. but it doesn't get you, it doesn't get you going. Right. Because the thing that gets you going is being outraged about. And maybe once the like general starts in earnest and Trump starts to become more of a thing, people will remember that they, however much they dislike a particular policy or decision by Biden, they dislike Trump a lot more. That's the whole, that's the bet. Yeah. That's the whole. Which is not, not super exciting. <laughs> about but where we but are. Yeah. yeah. Um, it is worth noting that uh, prior to this post, the White House had avoided using TikTok over national security concerns. Mm -hmm. They still are. The White House is not on TikTok, but the campaign is. Um, was this just it seemed like this was just necessity here yeah so How, like does it concern you <laughs> i mean so obviously whatever campaign staffer is uploading these videos is not going to be do it from a phone that also has the nuclear launch codes <laughs> on it <laughs> in fact they don't give campaign staffers the nuclear launch codes they don't they Come do not on. No, I do not. just to just for like a day just for a day yeah. um i do get the kind of discomfort on national security grounds with American presidents and presidential candidates having to rest their political fortune to some degree on the algorithmic whims of a Chinese social media platform at a time of extremely high stakes geopolitical rivalry with China. Mm. Um, and obviously there were some rounds. Put it, in the, of, put it in the not great column. Yeah, it's not, it's not <laughs> ideal. And like this came up a few times when some of the Republican presidential candidates who were like really anti-China of course, I'll ended up joining TikTok. And to be honest, I was not super concerned about it then, nor am I with this. And I just think that if Beijing wanted to influence a big American presidential election, they have much more powerful, much bigger levers for doing that than like which political campaign does better on TikTok. And even if they did want to like pressure TikTok to push the algorithm in one direction to influence the campaign, they could do that regardless of whether or not the campaign was itself posting videos to TikTok or not. Yes. Um, but on on some level, like this dilemma that you see like Vivek Ramaswamy or Joe Biden face of like, do we get on TikTok is like, I really kind of sympathize with it because don't we all every day face the dilemma of whether to be on social platforms that we know are evil, but also rely on to like navigate our world because of how dominant they are? Yeah. Yeah, our whole our, this whole podcast is just one big uh, example Pulling of hypocrisy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is Joe Biden take the offline challenge. <laughs> and we'll post about it on TikTok That's with you. Right. Uh, all right. Finally, Selena Gomez is not giving away free Le Creuset. Uh, this week, a deep fake scam of the actress went viral in it. An AI version of Selena's voice informs viewers that due to a packaging error, <laughs> she has 3,000 Le Crusades to give away. Let's play it. Hey, everyone. It's Selena Gomez here. Due to a packaging error, we can't sell 3,000 Le Creuset cookware sets. So I'm giving them away to my loyal fans for free. If you're seeing this ad, you can get a free Le Creuset cookware set today. But just a heads up, there are a few rules. You must live in the United States and you can only get one free kitchen set per household. All you have to do is click the button below and answer a few questions. These will only be given out until the end of the day today, so don't hesitate. Supplies are running out, so get yours while you can. Thank you guys for all your support and I hope you love your new cookware set. What a deal. What a barg. Just the the like the dull monotone I know. of the voice. I know. 
it's so hilarious or terrifying or a little bit of both i think it's i think it's it's both so just to like walk through this scam what mm. happens <laughs> is that you fill out your information and it says it's ten dollars shipping and handling for the lake crusade mm -hmm. and <laughs> <laughs> spoiler alert spoiler alert there's no La it. there's no lake crusade and then you start getting a 90 dollar credit card charge every month that recurs monthly and like most people will see that and dispute it but the way these scams always work like traditionally scams is that some number of people won't see it or take them a while or they won't go through the like hassle of uh disputing it and so then these scammers will make a ton of money and like i have to say the more i have thought about this video the more it actually does kind of scare me, <laughs> like really. And like makes me take AI seriously in a way that I didn't before. Because we talked a lot about before with AI is we talked about like political disinformation. We talked about the threat to entertainment. And I think like part of my skepticism was always that it's a very high bar mm. to develop some sort of AI deep fake that will convincingly persuade a large number of voters mm -hmm. or it will like write a summer blockbuster that will crowd out actual artists. But if your goal is scamming people with AI deep fakes, like that's a numbers game. Scamming yeah. has always been a numbers game. It's a much lower bar to clear. And like an email scam only has to hook one in 10,000 people or one in 100,000 people yeah. for it to be incredibly lucrative. These AIs are so cheap to make. They require such a small front end investment. And I, look, I think this one uh, is hilarious in, in many ways. Yes. Um, there's a very funny tweet from uh, someone named Alex Steed. He said, I love the reality this deep fake suggests. There's a factory mishap. <laughs> Selena's manager gets a call. We need Selena to appear in a video immediately. She will not. They tell her they'll settle for a voice memo, but it's not negotiable. She does so, but very begrudgingly. <laughs> <laughs> that was honestly the weirdness of her voice is what, so I watched this. This is kind of embarrassing. I've been having trouble sleeping lately because mm -hmm. I haven't been exercising because I'm packing for a move. Mm -hmm. uh, I watched this on my phone at 3 a.m., like bleary, half awake. Like a good like a good offline challenge. That's absolutely, <laughs> yes. I'm trying to get my addiction levels up to, for the next <laughs> challenge. And it, like for a second, I was like, wow, that's so weird that Selena Gomez is doing this for Le Creuset. <laughs> and part of what fooled me beyond being an idiot is like the weirdness of the voice. I was like, it's like she, it's like she makes this announcement once a week. She's like, hey guys, it's <laughs> Selena again. Another factory. Here. Here we go. We got more. Just you know the drill. <laughs> Sign up. <laughs> but like, this is also the current version of free AI for people, right? Like this right. is going to get better. Right. So the fact that like when she's talking there, it's not like mm -hmm. her mouth's moving, but it's not really lining up. The voice sounds right. too monotone. Right. Like it could get better. This, right. The context itself is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't even have to get better. Right. Because it's so cheap. It's uh, so easy mm. for so many scammers to try it. And scams already cause $9 billion a year just for Americans get roped in in scams. And that's just what we know about. And it's yeah. like, it's a huge impact on the economy. Like the elderly and underprivileged people are disproportionately affected by it. A lot of people go bankrupt from it. It's a really big problem. And internet, automated internet scamming itself is also a huge problem just because of the way that it can completely flood spaces. Like um, email hmm. almost crashed in like the early 2000s because email spam was becoming so lucrative and so cheap to automate that something like 99.99% .99 of all emails were automated spam. And it's actually the- um, it's pretty, I feel like that's where we are at now. It's, <laughs> it's, gotten, it's gotten worse. There were, there were real predictions in the late 90s that it was going to get so much worse that it would completely crash the internet just because there would be so much email. And actually, the machine learning algorithms that form the basis of social media were first invented to defeat email spam. Huh. Wow. Look at that. You learn something new every day here. <laughs> and if you want your Le Creuset. <laughs> Folks, there was a factory error. We're so grateful to all of our fans. <laughs> How much do you want to bet? that uh, I don't know whether it's this year or years down the road, there's going to be a Donald Trump he's deep gonna fake go, where he's, he's going to be trying, selling like Trump coins. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's going to be I mean, making a lot of money he's, from his supporters yeah, he's on that. Al he's already doing that. He's already yeah, yeah, going to say. Right. He's doing it with democracy now, but there'll be some money in it later. <laughs> um, all right. After the break, my conversation with Cass Sunstein about the power of noticing what's right in front of us. Cass Sunstein, welcome to Offline. It is so great to be on Offline. 
It's been uh, so long since the two of us got a chance to catch up that we actually had to uh, schedule a podcast interview just to chat. Completely. So this is 100% social, but maybe we'll just <laughs> substance in the middle of this. Well, so in a typical year, I don't read as many books as you publish, um, but I'm excited to talk about your latest look again, uh, which is about why we stop noticing things that are great and get used to things that are terrible. Uh, and a lot of what you cover in the book, we've actually talked about here on this show, social media, misinformation, the rise of authoritarianism. But before we get into all that, what made you want to write this one? Well, there's been an outpouring of books on humanity and behavior. If you go to the airport, maybe two thirds of them are going to be about something about behavior. And some of them are, aren't as terrible as others. <laughs> there's one thing that's not covered at all in the books, which is the most fundamental of all, which is that if you are a dog or a cat or a horse or a person, uh, you're very alert to change. So if it gets really cold today, my gosh, is it terrible. Whereas if you've been around cold for, let's say, a month, you're kind of used to it. And this is fundamental to living creatures, that what's fantastic and old is treated as background noise, and what's terrible and old is basically subject to the worst phrase in the English language, it is what it is. <laughs> so I know you wrote this book with a neuroscientist. What does the what does the science say about why our brains uh, habituate, which is what you guys uh, the term that you use in the book? Okay, so uh, the human brain is showing every moment decreasing sensitivity to stimuli. So if you go in cold water, your brain is going to react. It's going to show a big surprise signal, and it's going to be, I'm not the neuroscientist of the pair, so I'm going to use a very technical term, your brain is on fire. But once you are in the cold water for, let's say, 15 minutes, your brain comes down and knows you're not in danger, and it's basically not noticing it anymore. You can demonstrate the neuroscience pretty easily if you show a colored object and put a little like a cross in the middle. This is not a religious idea. It's just a crossed object. You stare at the cross, then the colors are going to disappear. You won't even see them anymore. That's because the brain is very sensitive to novelty and everything turns gray in the brain if it's staying steady state. Yeah, I, I saw that part in the book and uh, it, it worked. I suddenly saw a bunch of gray. Um, the part of the book about social media helped me understand something I've always wondered about, which is why don't we notice that too much screen time and especially too much social media can make us miserable? Uh, can you talk about what you guys learned? Yeah, if you put something in your mouth, let's say your dentist tells you to put something in your mouth that hurts a little bit, after a while, it's just this is how your mouth is, and you you know eat and talk, and your mouth hurts a little bit. Then when you take it out, you notice, my gosh, it's all comfortable and great now, and I don't have a little jolt to my system anymore. Social media is like that. It's like something in your mouth where uh, I use social media, I like social media, uh, but it's kind of in my mouth and it hurts a little bit. We habituate to it in the sense that maybe a really angry thing or a really uh, ridiculous thing or a really false thing uh, isn't going to trigger the surprise signal anymore. That's the habituation aspect. But an angry thing or a false thing or a you know, terrible thing is, is going to deliver a jolt, but it's a jolt which we take like a background noise in our system. And that's not great for our system. No, I, think, I, I also think that this is the major challenge with um, getting people to realize the harms of social media just because a, a lot of times you'll see studies about the harms of social media and then you'll get people who are social media users pushing back and saying, well, I like it and it's it's good for me and it helps me. And, and it's like, yeah, I know you like it, but like, guess what? We all, when you're addicted to something, <laughs> you think it's fine. You don't, you don't, you don't do something and be like, oh, I know I'm, I'm, I'm addicted right now and it's bad for me. You keep doing it. 
There's recent work suggesting that Instagram and TikTok users, if they're asked, how much money would you demand to be off it for a month? They'll say real money, maybe $100. That's consistent with your addiction story. If they're asked, how much would you pay to be off Instagram or TikTok contingent on everyone being off Instagram or TikTok? Then they say, oh, I'll pay you. I'll pay you for them. That's fascinating. <laughs> That's fascinating. And what does the research say about the benefits of taking a break from social media? Uh, hi. So this is true for many things. Taking a break is a, a good thing from uh, uh, various because you can see them anew. Um, for social media, if you take a break, it's it's going to be a, a good time. That is the time off is highly likely to be a good time. If you're really intensely addicted, the first 10 minutes or first hour might be painful, but it will be good. And then when you go back to it, probably you'll go back with less enthusiasm. And what's good about it, you'll uh, benefit from more than you would have had you not taken the break. So breaks from social media are 90% positive. Yeah, I was interested in some of the studies you cited where people who deactivated their accounts then took a break, but chose to reactivate them later. Is that is that addiction? Is that... <laughs> This is a phenomenal finding that people were asked, how much would you have to be paid to be off uh, social media? And they said, a bunch of them said $100. And the experimenters said, okay, we'll give you $100 and you're off. And then they took the people who were off and compared to the people to whom they didn't give the $100. And they found along every measure, the people who were off had a better month. They were less depressed. They were less anxious. They were more satisfied with their lives. They were happier. Everything they threw at people, people were better off being off for that month. And then they asked those people, okay, now how much would we have to pay you to be off? And they said, $87. Almost the same. Whereas they should have said, you don't have to pay us anything. We're going to stay off. Now, what we don't know is whether people are addicted. So the idea of being off another month is like, you know, what's the best TV show there is? There was an old TV show called Younger. It was very good. I was mildly addicted to. You were, I I you were a Younger fan? <laughs> I really loved her. Um, so if that show had been taken off my screen that I would have suffered and maybe social media users, some of them are like that, so they're addicted. And it might be some of them, this is a happier story, that some of them are made a little depressed and a little anxious, but they learn about politics, they learn about their family, they learn about something that maybe agitates them. Hopefully that's not true in the case of learning about their family, but maybe it sometimes is. And so they're a little sadder, but still it's worth it because they're just uh, keeping up. One other point you guys make, you know, social media is a fire hose of, of negative information. Why are we drawn to consume and share information that makes us feel bad? Well, it can be uh, energizing. So if you see something, and I'm finding this myself, I confess, in politics these days, mm. the things that are really not cheer cheering, in fact, just the opposite, they're energizing. So they get your juices flowing. And to be in a state of agitation, um, humanity kind of needs that, mm. even if it's not going to lengthen your life or improve your day. And so outrage is uh, uh, an upper. And to, to feel outrage or even fear can be something that people are drawn to, like a horror movie where no, the person you care about is in trouble. Maybe that's what social media keeps telling us. Well, and then I think what's interesting about the science of habituation uh, combined with this need for feeling outrage or agitation is sort of the more outrage and agitation you feel at each new piece of bad news or outrageous news, it dulls the senses of how outraged you are. Uh, completely. And this is uh, worrisome for our country, I think, where there are terrible things. We can name names if you want. And, uh, and those things which maybe five years ago or seven years ago would have seemed so horrifying as to be disqualifying or, you know, really universal uh, outcry producing, they now are uh, normalized. And the notion of normalization that is kind of around us but to get clarity that it's how the brain works, that normalization means we keep hearing something and then we uh, aren't so alert to its terribleness anymore. 
Yeah, so I was gonna uh, I was gonna uh, cover this later, but I'll, I'll just jump into it now. Um, you have a chapter towards the end titled "The Devastatingly Incremental Nature of Descent into Fascism." Fun. Uh, <laughs> why does habituation make the loss of democracy difficult to notice? Okay, let's note that uh, some of the science of habituation tells us that there are amazing things around us like friends and family and spouses that we normalize and don't get as excited about as we should. And so that's a cheerful thing. Mm -hmm. But we're going to go there to the uh, distressing. Um, if you look at the best contemporaneous works on not Nazi Germany, that is in real time stories, um, people are noticing slowly, if, you know, in the history books, it seems really fast, Hitler and then uh, war and Holocaust. That's not how it was experienced in real time. It was Hitler and then kind of threats of various sorts and celebrations that seemed a little kind of over the top and distracting. And books, things are happening to books and Jews are kind of being monitored. And, and what happened was, as people described it in real time, they thought at first, this is like an increment that's not good. But it's not going to end up where it did. And each increment was bigger and less horrifying than it would have been if it had happened all in a flash. So the people who were there said it was like uh, being in a field with the, the uh, corn growing and growing and growing, and then it's over your head. But you, but you didn't notice it going over your head until it was. So the fall of democracy is often in stages, and that's what makes it possible. If it happened all at once, people would say, absolutely not. Yeah, it made me, it, it was pretty frightening to read because of the obvious parallels with our current predicament uh, with American politics right now. And it made me wonder if habituation is explained, would help explain why it can seem like we are sleepwalking into a second Trump term. I think it's completely fair to say that some of the, you know, almost surreal terribleness uh, that we've observed is made possible through habituation, that the brain signals it as a part of a normal American life. And that wouldn't have been possible in, say, 2011, when giants moon blew up. So, so I guess my question is, I remember in 2016, after Trump won, and in 2017 and 2018, there was a lot of, this is not normal, don't normalize this, don't let this become normal. And then that didn't really do that much. <laughs> that kind of faded away. And what do we do about the, in the context of saving democracy, what do we do about the fact that people uh, in this country have maybe habituated to not only the the sort of creeping threat of authoritarianism, but Trump himself and all of his antics. Well, let's talk a little bit about dishabituation in general, shall we? Yeah. So there are some people in American history who have been a long phrase, dishabituation entrepreneurs, where they take a practice that's normal and they either literally or become and they like hold a bright spotlight on it and make it seem uh, anything but normal. Martin Luther King Jr. was a dissipation entrepreneur, said if we're wrong, then the Constitution of the United States is wrong. Um, Catherine McKinnon, who named sexual harassment, she was the most important person behind that. She was a dishabituation entrepreneur. People in the arts are often dishabituation entrepreneur. People who run podcasts are often dishabituation entrepreneurs. They, they hold uh, a mirror up and get people to see something in, for, for truth. Um, in a way that you might not in your normal day. So if you measure reality against what happened, let's say, yesterday or the day before yesterday, and let's say, say, say something terrible in politics, then you might not see it. It might seem like, you know, a hill and you're a little further down the hill than you were. But if you hold up a mirror compared to, let's say, uh, 
uh, founding ideals, or let's say contemporary ideals, like the ideals of, um, I'll name someone, uh, uh, George Bush Sr., or I'll name someone else, Barack Obama. And uh, if you compare their understandings of what our country was about with certain other understandings, then the other understandings start to look really, really peculiar. Mm. And I think that we people have to keep doing that. I mean, when you think of how things have gone right in countries that were at risk in Europe, let's say, including over the last decade, that's that's how it happened. People hold up a mirror, held up a mirror to uh, an existing uh, Stephen King novel or Philip Roth novel in the making, and then people said, "I don't want to live in that novel." Yeah, it it made me think of um, the January sixth hearings. Which, uh, before they happened, I wondered if they would be successful uh, because, you know, people we went through January 6th and now we've moved on and voters and American people tend to not like to look in the past about things. They want to move forward. But it was really powerful. The hearings were powerful and well done, partly because of what you describe, right, which is it held a mirror up to both what happened on January 6th and what America at its best stands for. And I think even just having, you know, a Republican, Liz Cheney on the committee and Democrats together, right? Like it, sh it showed something bigger. And I do wonder if um, as we move forward in 2024, it's going to be more important to sort of tell a story about how far we've drifted um, since Trump came to power in 2016 versus, you know, just yelling about how uh, this isn't normal. I can say that Representative Cheney the artist formerly known as Representative Cheney. She was my student at the, at the University of Chicago. Really? I didn't know that. She was a, a memorable student. She was terrific. And what, what was memorable about her was her uh, unimpeachable integrity. And I didn't use the word impeachable as a pun, but that's, that's just how she was and is, where she was definitely and quite far right of center in a way that was just principled. So that's just how she is. So she was kind of bound to be, what, whether it was against the left or the right, a person of principle who would be uh, not going to habituate to, to, to terribleness because of her strong you know, moral grounding. And you're completely right that that's what that hearing did. And I'm thinking of McCarthyism as you talk. We don't talk maybe a whole lot about it, but McCarthyism was uh, on the way towards being normalized. And in some big segments of our country, it was normalized, where McCarthy was like a uh, 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 an icon of wisdom. And then the have you no shame, that, that line... Uh, broke a spell, really. It it uh, it dishabituated people too. That in real time, the have you no shame, people felt a little like they were waking up from a dream, and they were themselves a little ashamed. Many for being uh, McCarthy adjacent. Well, related to this is um, the propaganda that uh, authoritarians use and the repetition of propaganda that they use. Uh, you write about that. Uh, you have a, a chapter on misinformation. How does habituation explain why we are so willing to believe things that aren't true? Okay, this is cool and concerning. So I don't know if you heard that Tiger Woods was very surprising this morning. Tiger Woods announced his retirement from golf, and he's actually running for president. <laughs> Okay, so you, you know it's false, and the people who are listening know what I just said was false. But And I chose something that was uh, palpably false. But everyone who heard that, including, I fear, me, is going to have in some part of the brain a question. Is Tiger Woods running for president? So this is called truth bias, where the idea is if people are hear something, they tend to believe it in some measure just by virtue of the fact that it was said, and it's connected with something even more dramatic called the illusory truth effect, which is if a, a falsehood is repeated multiple times, and we'll get to why this is so, people tend to believe it's true, even if they have no reason to think it's true. So if I told you 17 times that Tiger Woods is running for president, the likelihood that you'd think, well, maybe he's running for president would jump. And the 
illusory truth effect, that is repetition breeds a belief in truth, has been observed in people who have a lot of education, people who don't, don't have much, people who are young, people who have old, men and women, every demographic category. The only people who don't show the illusory truth effect is people with Alzheimer's, and that's understandable because they don't remember, so they don't have the phenomenon working. Okay, why is there the truth bias and why is there the illusory truth effect? It's that if something is easy to process in the head, this is the neuroscience of it, we, we tend to think it's true. Easier processing leads to a belief in the truthfulness of something. And I confess there was something in my mind, I hope not in yours, at one point where the notion of Hillary Clinton's emails created a kind of sinking feeling associated not just with the propagandistic nature of it, but associated with, I think, the false view that she actually did something quite wrong, which I don't believe. But because I heard it so many times, it was easy to process, and some part of my head I kind of thought, well, maybe. Okay, so uh, the brain processes easily something that's said at least twice, and that means people will tend to think it's so. And if you think something about uh, health, uh, maybe something about vitamin C, or if you think something about politics, maybe about uh, President Biden, it might have no resemblance to the truth. It might be just you've heard it a number of times, and it's hard to get out of the head the thought that that's just frequently repeated lie. So with all this research in mind, are there lessons for people who are fighting misinformation and, and trying to develop messages that people believe? Completely. So here's uh, an experiment that helps explain what you do and what you don't do. If people see on a glass the following uh, uh, sign, no cockroach was ever in this glass, they don't want to drink from the glass. <laughs> That's because the word cockroach and this glass are in the same sentence, and people associate the two. So to repeat a lie isn't a very good thing, even in the context of uh, uh, debunking it. Uh, in, if, if it's uh, debunked in a way that doesn't include the content of the lie itself, that's smart. If the source of the lie is challenged rather than the content of the lie, that's smart. Yeah. On social media, if they say, here's the thing, it's false, that's better than not having the false label, but it's not better than not circulating the thing as much or than taking it down because it's false. So, uh, I mean, you have, if I may say, a completely brilliant way of repeating lies in a way that makes them seem hilariously ridiculous. That's smart also, mm. because then people are laughing and thinking, my gosh, rather than, oh, and if they laugh and think it's ridiculous rather than, oh, uh, that's that's effective. It's it's as you say that I'm thinking about uh, our old boss, Barack Obama. And um, I went through many speeches with him where he would say there's all these conspiracies out there. There's these lies that Republicans are telling. And I know you're not supposed to repeat them, but I want to take them on. We did this most notably in the um speech to Congress about the Affordable Care Act, and he wanted to go through death panels, you know, the health care is going to be for undocumented immigrants. He wanted to go through each one and debunk it, which we ended up doing. But the whole time I was trying to think, I get his concern about he has to address what's out there already because people are believing it. And so I think that impulse was good, but also I don't want to repeat it for people uh, because of this very problem that you're talking about. Yeah, it's a risky strategy. Now, our old boss, in my view, can do no wrong. But, uh, Same. Yeah. But <laughs> not that. It might have been wrong. Yeah. But what I think is what's interesting is that you point out there's ways to address people's concerns that are that develop because of misinformation directly without repeating the actual lie or falsehood itself and, and still be effective. <laughs> We do a poison pill that's directed at the purveyor of the lie mm. rather than a kind of serious engagement with the content of the lie that can be more effective. Can you talk about the experiment that was done um, with the trust and distrust uh, uh, yes. options on social media? I found that fasc fascinating. 
so if this was a, a, a experiment which created a little social media platform in which people could press trust rather than like, or they could trust distrust rather than dislike. And it turned out that the potential uh, trust button both got more truthful things circulated and got people more reluctant to circulate things that weren't truthful. So people were incentivized to say trustworthy things and trustworthy things spread more. And that resulted in a re reduction in falsehood and a reduction in belief in falsehood. So I, I think that whether trust or, or distrust is exactly the right thing for, let's say, Facebook to use, TBD, but something in this domain would be much more effective than like and dislike if the goal is to get truth out there yeah i have um mostly criticisms for uh twitter since elon musk has taken over but i do think that the community notes feature uh is uh possibly beneficial for some of the reasons you're talking about yeah, my well be. yeah so, so what we want to do is incentivize people to communicate not whether they're excited about some statement but whether they think it's credible mm -hmm. so you end the book by arguing that seeing the world from new perspectives is one way to overcome habituation and note that, quote, more than at any other point in history, human beings can be placed in contact with people dissimilar to themselves and with modes of thought and action unlike those with which they are familiar, which sounds right. And yet, like as the world has become more connected, um, it hasn't seemed to improve mental health, lessened our screen addiction, slowed the spread of information, misinformation, prevented the rise of authoritarianism. And it seems like in many cases, the opposite has happened. Why, why do you think that is? Okay, let's talk about two people. One of them is famous. And the famous one is Julia Roberts, who was a, a hero of our book. Mm -hmm. uh, Julia Roberts was interviewed not long ago and asked, what's a perfect day? And she said, a perfect day for me is I wake up, I make breakfast for my kids, I take them to school, I um, start to get ready to have lunch with my husband. I, I do that. Then it's starting to be time to get ready to pick up. And then she stops herself and she says, it's boring. And she says, because I'm a, an actor, because of my job, I go away. And when I come back, it's surrounded by pixie dust. It resparkles. And so what she's saying is that her going away makes what she takes for granted, what she would otherwise take for granted, that's amazing. You know, she has a great life. She sees it as fantastic. Okay. The other story is not a famous person. It's someone in China. I taught in China a few decades ago, actually. And I, I taught a U.S. Supreme Court case about the right to travel. And as I taught it, it's a pretty, you know, uh, ordinary Supreme Court case. I taught it because it was kind of ordinary and simple. And I felt even something was happening in the room. They were getting very upset and, and sad. It was like I had told them some something very tragic and, and terrible. And I asked them after, I asked, they were all in the Communist Party, by the way. I asked one of them afterwards, why are we all so sad? They said, as we learn about America, China seems very dark. Hmm. And uh, that was the theme of my weeks there, where I wasn't trying to do anything. I was just trying to tell them about American law. They thought a right to travel, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, this is uh, like a, a dream of possibility. And a number of those things aren't perfect in China. Can we agree on that? Yeah. But some of those people are now working on things that make things, let's say, a little further from terrible than they would otherwise be. Some of those people now are in their 50s and 60s. And so there are people in Turkey and in uh well, even Russia and and in countries where things aren't going so well, for whom exposure to other things have created uh, possibility and practices. And in the U.S., you know, for all the serious, what's the right word, challenges we're facing now, if you look at how things are now compared to how things were, let's say, in 1955, that's because of exposure to stuff. So I clerked for Thurgood Marshall, who 
went to Howard Law School and was exposed to a thousand and one things and thought, you know, segregation, what's that about? And the idea that that was normal and, you know, something to which we should habituate. He was kind of a rebellious type anyhow, but but he was exposed to stuff that made him think uh, this could be a, a rebellion that would work. So the day is young. Um, no. Well, uh, and it sounds like the lesson here is a very old one and a moral one, which is it is valuable to step in someone's shoes uh, and and walk around in them and try to learn about different perspective, experience different things, uh, get outside your own mind, uh, try to figure out, have empathy, develop empathy for other people. And um, that would make uh, so it's, it's really sort of an individual call to action more than anything else. Um, to help uh, help solve some of the problems that we're facing right now. Completely, both with respect to individual things that are awful that people are facing that maybe some of us aren't subjected to but can help with. And also, this is, we've known each other a long time for me to write what is in some ways a self-help book is really against type because it we don't know how to write a self-help book or to engage in self-help. <laughs> Nonetheless, this book is, it has a little bit of a flavor of that where uh, for people to, you know, uh, 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 be thrilled by something that they take for granted, which might be someone who likes them, who's willing to be married to them, or a house where the heating works or the air conditioning works or something outside like a tree. It's pretty fantastic to have outside. Yeah. Well, that that's why I thought it would be as soon as you told me about it, I thought it would be perfect for for this podcast because we get a little self-helpy on offline. And uh, and so this was it. Look again. Fantastic book. Uh, it's out February 27th. Cass, thanks for stopping by offline. This was fun. Thank you. Great pleasure. <laughs>